So if creating threats is on one side of the coin, we can say that identifying threats is on the other side of the coin. Now, identifying threats is actually a skill that is never fully mastered in chess, right? Because you're still going to always, no matter how good you are, miss a threat from time to time because chess is a game where threats are happening all the time. And the best players, they're facing, you know, they're posing so many little problems and so many niggly little threats and from time to time a really big threat as well that even though your understanding might be excellent, even just a small lapse in concentration can cause you to miss one. Now, there are many, many different factors that we need to take into account in order to identify threats and it's impossible to do an exhaustive analysis of all of them for our purposes. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch upon briefly by showing you a half dozen or so examples, example positions, I'm going to touch upon uh, some of the major points, right? And then some of the minor points I might just reference. And you guys will, I'm certain, have a lot of resources where these different concepts by many creators on this site will be talked about in much more depth. Some of the topics I'm going to cover for now are going to be things like king safety. That's a huge one. And pieces that are either, for instance, undefended, or maybe they have too many responsibilities. They're, they're overloaded. They have too many tasks that they're carrying out. Pawns as well that may be attacked more often than defended, or even attacked an equal number of times than defended. So such that if you attack it another time, it immediately creates a strong threat. Anything really that relates to the instability of either your position in order to identify the threat or your opponent's position, you know, in which case he should be on the lookout to identify whatever possible threats you can throw at him. Other points uh, mentioned will be the idea of using x-rays to your advantage. That's a really big one. Uh, positional threats also exist. It doesn't just have to be winning a piece. It can be, for example, uh, ruining your opponent's pawn structure. The removal of the defender is a concept we'll touch upon. We'll show an example or two of that. Intermezzos as well. I have an example of an intermezzo to show you guys. And uh, just any type of simple piece geometry, you know, that can lead to double attacks like we saw in the creating a threat section. And, uh, you know, one very simple example of that is a fork. So we'll show an example of that now. Finally, you can sometimes simply threaten to transition from one stage of the game, like the middle game, right onto an end game. And that can be a very strong threat if, for instance, the middle game is okay for you, but on the other hand, the end game is a losing end game, then you really need to be able to identify that. And in that case, in order to figure out that that's a real threat, what you need to do is you need to work on your end games and you need a deep understanding of that. But anyway, enough discussion of the different topics. Let's actually show you guys a few positions, starting with this one. So here, the topics I want to discuss are, number one, the opposite colored bishops that we see on this board, right? The materialist level, each side has five pawns and, uh, you know, a rook each and a bishop each. But this is a big difference. White has the dark squared bishop and black, on the other hand, has the light squared bishop. And what does this mean? Well, it means a couple of things. The first is that any pawn, any black pawn or piece that is on a dark square is going to be especially vulnerable. So in this case, it would be the rook on e7 and the pawns on a5, b6 and c5. Why? Well, because white has this unopposed dark squared bishop and so his firepower on the dark squares is simply greater than black's. So if you're black in this position, you would really want to be careful, for example, that you don't maneuver the rook onto a square like d8 and suddenly you put it on the same diagonal as this pawn on b6 and that would lead to something like a fork here on c7, forking the pawn on b6 and the rook on d8. So this would be one example. And similarly, if you're white here, you have the opposite problem, which is your dark squares are perfectly safe because you have a dark square bishop and he does not, but your light squares may come under fire. So again, you would be thinking, well, what do you have on a light square? And as it happens, white has a lot of material on a light square. The majority of his pieces are on light squares. And so that is the first thing that we would think of 
in terms of what kind of threats may occur. For instance, bishop to d5 attacking our highest value piece should be considered bishop to e4 attacking the base of our pawn chain, this pawn chain here on the queen side. If the base collapses, then after that, the next pawn can fall. And then after that, the final third pawn can fall. And that can quickly spell disaster. It's the same, of course, for black. And finally, of course, I mentioned the rook as the highest value piece, but that's not really true. I mean, there's a piece that is priceless, and that is the king. And so we should always look at the king's safety. And if we consider king safety here, we notice that this bishop is exerting a big pressure on this point on g2. And because of the fact that the g2 pawn, it is a light square, and white may struggle to defend himself along those light squares, we can immediately see a potential threat for black here, and that is the move rook to e2. Rook to e2 would lead black to coordinate his forces, his light squared bishop and his rook, pressuring not only the base of our pawn chain here on c2 on the queen side, but the base of our king side pawn chain. And that would be a real disaster because it would come in with check. And if you guys can picture it, once it's a check, it would actually be a double attack on that bishop and the king. The king would have to move and we would lose the bishop and we would even be stuck. We would even be caught in a bit of a windmill for those of you who are familiar with this tactical motif or tactical theme. So therefore, uh, rookie two is very, very serious threat. And we can see that it's the result of the fact that there is a point here that has one attacker and only one defender. It's a light squared point. It's the point where his uncontested light squared bishop is crashing down on. It's very near our king, so it compromises our king's safety. And one very final detail, his rook is better placed than our rook. It's on an open file while ours is on a closed file. And so the rook can activate itself and enter the seventh rank, which if any viewer has read a book on chess fundamentals, one of the first things that you'll probably read about when they talk about rooks is that they really, it's very important to watch out for that possibility of entering the seventh rank in the case that, you know, we were looking at it from the white perspective, entering the seventh rank, or in the case from the black perspective, we want to make sure black does not access the second rank, or at least we better have a plan to deal with it if he does. So here, white, for example, does have a plan because it's him to move. And he says, well, I want to defend this point. I know that rookie two, I've identified this as the big threat. And now I can take measures against it. I can go rook to f4 with the idea that I'm going to transfer my rook on over to f2. So in the event of rookie two, now rook would go to f2 and this problem is dealt with. Now, rook takes, bishop takes, and we can see that the fire has been extinguished. On the other hand, remember we identified this possibility of bishop to e4 hitting the base of the pawn chain. That's a concern because all of the white pawns are on light squares. So what happens if bishop to e4? Does white just resign? Well, not quite, because the black queenside pawns are on dark squares. So white cannot defend directly because if he plays c3, then bishop to c2, and these pawns are going to be lost. But what he can do is he can go on the counterattack with the move bishop to g3. Now bishop takes c2, bishop to c7. Notice black is going after the base of the white pawn chain and white is doing the exact same thing and really causing damage with the bishops of their opposite colors. So bishop takes the second white pawn, bishop takes the first black pawn, bishop takes the third white pawn. So he does get there first. And as a consequence, black is left up a pawn. But the thing about it is with opposite colored bishops, even being down a pawn should be enough for white to hold a draw. Although it's also easy, of course, to make a mistake and go wrong here and lose the game. But in any case, with perfect play, white should be able to sneak a draw. We're not too concerned about the outcome of this fictitious game, as I just set up the position myself, but we're more so interested in the process of identifying threats, right? So here, notice that g2 pawn is very weak. It's on a light square. The king for white is a little bit weaker, and the 
more active rook threatens to go into the seventh rank from black's perspective or the second rank from white's perspective so white's spotted all of that has also spotted the particular arrangement of pawns on the light squares which are very strong for black and on the dark squares which are very strong for white and so factors those things in the beginning he deals with the most direct threat rookie two and then once that's happened he's aware that that secondary threat comes in but he has a plan for that which is well this time around unlike with g2 i can't prevent the threat of capturing my queenside pawns directly so i let them go but i use the assets in my position bishop g3 and i go after your pawns okay so that is the first position let's move on to the second one okay in this example here we're not too concerned about who it is to move uh, first but instead let's think about what might be the biggest concern in this position for white well if you see it i think that there there's actually two really really big concerns the first is his king safety it's really quite horrible here on g3 the king is being sort of harassed by so many of the black pieces and even this rook might crash down on e3 and the second no less important factor is the material if we do a material count we see that black has a lot of pawns he's got four more pawns than white and on top of that black has two rooks and white has only one so actually it doesn't really matter how safe or unsafe your king is the amount of material is going to be devastating and so we should consider well what if we were black in this position are we just going to expect our opponent to resign immediately or could there be any kind of defect with how we've played up until now if it's white to move well in terms of material our material advantage is so huge that that's not going to go away anytime soon in terms of forks or undefended pieces or anything like that everything is pretty safe our rook is being defended our rook on e7 our rook on f4 is also even better defended the rook and the queen both defend each other very well and we have a bunch of threats for like the next move such as uh, potentially sacrificing this rook just to be able to give a nasty check on f4 and just win on the spot for example just i will show such a line let's imagine that uh, white played something like queen a3 now rook goes to g4 check king takes rook queen f4 check now the king can go one place or another if it goes to h5 then after rook e5 it's just going to be checkmate on the next move and if king to h3 then queen h4 is also checkmate so black has a direct mating threat here in this position however if it's white to move he should worry about one thing and one thing only and that is his restricted king mobility if you look at the king if it were black to play on his move right now where could his king go in theory a king on g8 let's say that there was nothing around it would have five squares that it could move to but if we look at this position two of those squares are unavailable due to the black pawns and two of those squares are unavailable because of the influence of one of white's pieces that means that the black king actually can only go to one square it's similar in terms of its restriction when compared with the white king the white king on g3 under normal circumstances could go eight different squares and yet he's blocked by his own pieces or pawns and then this rook on f4 this protected rook on f4 is covering four of those and so it only leaves one square here on h3 i should say actually that the rook protects five of them because uh, the rook itself prevents access to f4 so therefore white could only if he had to move move his king to one square if black had to move he could only move his king to one square as well so both kings are very restricted can white do something about this and in fact he can he can begin with the most forcing move that's what we should consider if we are black here what are the forcing moves well most forcing are the checks so queen check or rook check of course rook check would just be silly he would lose the rook so we go queen check instead now how can black deal with this check he must block the rook e8 would just get taken so he must block with knight to f8 now imagine that if you're black in this position you're asking yourself well 
am I safe to allow this check? Imagine that the previous movie you saw the check, but you said, okay, I can block. So are you actually safe? Well, you should once again think about how restricted is the king. Well, it's actually even more restricted now because there are no squares that it can move to. And also consider what checks are available. So the first check is here, rook h8. That will get you nowhere. But the second check in this particular case is devastating. After queen takes knight on f8, then after king takes queen, notice that the king can move, but only two squares. They're both on the same line. And the white rook is still here on h2, so it can drive up to h8 and checkmate. So, well, if you were black on this position, how to avoid disaster? Well, I assume, I don't know what the previous move was, but I assume that black already was in command. So just some move like maybe rook to e8, covering that rank, preventing any kind of checks, or maybe even some move like queen to c4. And the checks, the, the king is given more protection and then... Uh, things are okay for black. So that was the second position. And yeah, the moral of the story, always watch out for your king's safety, no matter how good your position is. Let's now move on to the third game.